Welcome back to Zenotes Live, and today we will be discussing diseases and immunity. And we have Afreen with us. Over to you, Afreen. Hello, everyone. So, like Ashwari said, today we're doing the chapter, the tenth chapter in IGCC Biology, that is diseases and immunity. So, disease and immunity does not does not have many subchapters. It's just one big chunk. So, there's ten point one. Um, so, this is the syllabus. So, you're going to define a few. Uh, terms and you're going to look at some processes. We're going to be looking at processes like phagocytosis, vaccination, what's active and passive immunity, and different ways of acquiring active and passive immunity. And we'll look at the different ways we can stay safe, how we can prevent infections, and how we can, and also we'll be looking a bit into detail in one type of infection that's cholera, the disease, and that's basically it. So first and foremost, the most important part about this chapter is you need to be able to define what is a pathogen. It's simple, it's straightforward. You need to say you need to be able to state that a pathogen is a disease-causing organism. It's an organism that causes diseases. Any way you phrase it, this is what you should be meaning. What you should be you should be very, very certain about what a pathogen is, because that's kind of the basic here, basic thing here. The next point. Again, one another basic thing is what's a transmissible disease. So a transmissible disease is a disease in which the pathogen can be passed from one host to another. So it's basically a disease that can be spread. Okay, it's kind of like the, the, the coronavirus, the virus that caused COVID-19 and all of this is happening. So it, you should be able to, you should have some base knowledge in this because of your experiences. But yeah, we'll be looking more into detail. Next, we need to know how pathogen is transmitted. So there's two main ways. There's first of all, there's direct contact. So this is when you come into contact with a bod with bodily fluids of a person who is infected with the disease. So th that could be blood, that could be saliva, other bodily fluids, could be feces. So yeah, that's the direct contact method. And there's in the, the, the indirect contact method. This, this could be from contaminated surface, that, which is why it's so important to wash your hands and sanitize surfaces regularly. So when you come into contact with a contaminated surface, you could uh, acquire the disease, the infection, because of you know cross-contamination. So if you are uh, infected with something yourself, you should be careful about you know not touching stuff, not touching surfaces, because in order to be mindful about other people that may or may not come into contact with that surface. So th that's why we have, so the surfaces, uh, the contaminated stuff could include the surface, it could include food, it could include animals, it could include air, which is why we wear masks and all that stuff. And yeah, that's basically it. So now we're discussing body defenses. So we have three main ways in which our bodies uh, are equipped to defend itself from pathogens. So the three, the three main ways are mechanical barriers, chemical barriers, and then we have cells that are specialized to provide defenses. So we look at the mechanical barriers first. So we have nostrils, and these nostrils contain hair, so they physically trap dust. So that's why it's so important not to remove your nose hairs, um, you know, the cosmetic pr procedures. Nose hairs, they... Um, serve a purpose and that is to help trap dust dust which could carry microorganisms inside them and also just cause uh, allergic reactions and then we have the next mechanical barrier method is your skin your skin has a thick outer layer of dead cells that basically prevent any pathogen from entering your system via any of the vast amount of surfaces that's available that which is why it's so important to treat wounds and cuts immediately not to leave them exposed that's why you have band-aids and plasters it's basically to cover that part up so that there's not an additional opening for a pathogens next up we have mechanical barriers so uh, sorry chemical barriers chemical barriers uh, kind of self-explanatory these use chemical methods to prevent pathogens or to kill them so first of all we have sticky mucus available in your nose, your trachea. Basically, the sticky mucus traps pathogen, and the mucus is produced by goblet cells, 
we will look more into detail about that one later. And then, so yeah, the first one is six sticky mucus. And the next one is your stomach. You, uh, if you remember from previous chapters, your stomach contains hydrochloric acid, and this is secreted by the wall to the stomach, and it kills many of the bacteria in the food. So that's why if for some reason your food is um, contaminated, it's uh, not safe to eat, but you've still eaten it, you, if your stomach will do its job, it's the acid present inside is not the perfect pH for bacteria to survive. And so the bacteria will die before it can cause any major harm to your body. However, if it does survive, then you'll experience food poisoning and vomiting and diarrhea, all of this. But yeah, most of it is prevented by the hydrochloric acid in your stomach. Next up, so we've covered mechanical, we've covered chem chemical. Now we look at the cells that are specially adapted for this function. So pathogens that manage to get through all the defenses that we have, the chemical, the mechanical, they are usually destroyed by white blood cells. White blood cells, you'll remember from the previous chapter, they're present in your blood and they basically produce antibodies. So these cells, some of these cells, there are two main types of cells that we look at here. So some of these cells, the first kind, they kind of take in or eat these pathogens. You know, that's not really eating it, but kind of consumes it and then it's digested using a variety of enzymes inside the cell. And this process is known as phagocytosis, and it's carried out by cells called phagocytes. The next one, the, uh, the second type of white blood cells, they produce antibodies that um, disable or kill the pathogen. So they either weaken the pathogen to a limit to the point where they cannot cause any harm, and they just are naturally adjusted from a body, or they kill the pathogen, so cannot do anything else. Now, there are these are the the what we've discussed so far are all natural methods. They're uh, by your own body. They're created by your own body. However, we have some external uh, defenses that we can use, employ, or yeah, deploy. There, there's vaccination. It's the most effective one. So, vaccination against diseases help produce antibodies very quickly and it's effective in most cases. So we'll look more into vaccinations later. So like I said, in during the syllabus, when I was describing the syllabus, we have active immunity and passive immunity. So first of all, we'll look at active immunity. Active immun immunity is defense against a pathogen by antibody production in the body. Now, this is very important. You should know this by heart. Active, active immunity causes the production of antibody. That's just it. Now, this could be um, either by exposure to a pathogen. So when you're infected due to something, so if you remember, um, if you're exposed to COVID so that you're, and you recover from it, so you have this immunity against it. So you're kind of safe for a few months. So that's active immunity because your body has produced antibodies. And now these antibodies also uh, cause the production of memory cells. So when you're, if you are infected by the same disease again, you have memory cells inside your body that kind of remembers how your body defeated that pathogen earlier and it deploys the same method so that the pathogen can be eradicated as quickly as possible. That's why when you're infected the second time, it's usually shorter because your body already knows what to do. Now the second, that's the natural way of active immunity you get infected by the disease. The other way is vaccination. Now vaccination is when a weakened version of the pathogen is administered to you, it's inside your uh, system, and then it triggers the production of antibody, which uh, also triggers the production of memory cells. So it's like you are being infected with the disease. However, it is a weakened one. So you won't be as affected as you would be uh, if you were acquiring the disease naturally. So when you get the vaccination, it triggers antibody production and memory cells. So once again, the memory cells kind of remember what happened the last time. And if you are infected again, the memory cells uh, already have a plan of what to do and how to uh, remove the pathogen from your system. So that's why um, vaccination is very important and it's a better way of acquiring immunity. 
Now, we look at pathogen and antigen. Antigen is basically a protein coat on the pathogen, okay? And each pathogen has its own antigens, and they are they are specific to the pathogen. They are they have specific shapes. Now, and and then antibodies are proteins that bind to the antigen, leading to the destruction of the pathogens. Uh, or they are marked for phagocytosis by phagocytes. Now, the important thing here is that antibody, antibodies produced each time for each disease is specific for the pathogen, for the antigen on the pathogen. Because like we've said already, antigens have specific shapes. So specific antibodies must be produced so that it's complementary to the specific antigens. So this sentence is important. Specific antibodies have complementary shapes which fit specific antigens. And antibodies produced are unique each time for each disease because of the unique shape of the antigens. And that's a very important point. You must remember that. And for most questions related to this topic, that is something you must mention. It could carry one or two marks. Um, depending on the question. And yeah, it's usually a paper four type of question. And so you get probably like a three, four mark question. And yeah, you have to describe the process of active immunity. And you might also be asked to describe the advantages of active immunity. We'll, we'll look at that later. Okay, this is basically what I said, vaccination, the weakened version of the pathogen or their antigens uh, are put inside the body. The antigens stimulate an immune, immune response by lymphocytes, that's the antibodies, uh, sorry, the white blood cells, and these white blood cells produce antibodies. And then memory cells are also produced, giving long-term immunity. Now, this mem the duration of the immunity kind of depends on the disease and on the memory cells itself. So for some disease, if you're infected once, it's highly unlikely that you'll ever get it again in your lifetime. However, for some diseases, there's like a very short duration period, probably like a few months. So yeah, it depends on the disease. And in all cases, vaccination is usually the best way to go. So that's why you have some, some vaccinations that need to be administered every few years or something, like the flu vaccine that you need to take every year. And then there are some vaccines that you take once in your life, like the polio vaccine. And yeah, that's that's that. Depends on the disease, depends on the antibodies. Okay, so we've looked at active immunity. That was all of that was active immunity. Now we have passive immunity. Passive immunity is a short term defense against a pathogen by antibodies acquired from another individual, including us across the placenta and in breast milk. Now the important thing here is that you're not exposed to the pathogen at all. Not, not the weakened version, not the actual version. There's no vaccination. You're not infected by anything. You have no exposure to the pathogen. You, however, there is the antibody to the pathogen that's directly being given to you. So this could be, this is usually more common for babies who are unable to, you know, take the vaccinations who are not qualified to take the vaccinations or you know the being exposed to the disease could be very harmful for them so that's why the best way for them to acquire immunity is through best breast milk which is why breast milk is always best for babies and then when if the baby is still in the womb there's the placenta so antibodies from the mother is transferred to the baby via various processes that we'll look into later in another chapter but for now, yeah, you all you need to know is that antibodies are passed on to the baby from the mother via the placenta, or if the baby is already born, it's via the breast milk. Now, the thing about passive immunity is it's short term, so you cannot rely on it for very long. That's why babies regularly need the breast milk, you know, because short term defense. And yeah, breast milk is basically very important for the development of passive immunity in infants, babies. And oh, another important point, memory cells are not produced in this type of immunity. Because it's short term, there's no memory cells produced. So memory cells, the function of memory cells is to provide long term immunity. However, that's not happening here. So there's no memory cells. And that's about passive immunity. Okay, I've said immunity so many times. <laughs> okay, so this is cholera. This is the specific disease that I was talking about. 
Cholera is a disease caused by a bacterium, that's bacteria, which is transmitted in contaminated water. So very important. Cholera is um, common in countries where the, the ac where access to safe and clean drinking water is limited and sparse. So that's why most people are exposed to contaminated water, which is why most people are exposed to cholera. Now, how does this bacteria work? It basically produces a toxin that causes the secretion of chloride ions into the small intestine. So chloride ions are moving into the small intestine and this basically changes the uh, water equilibrium thingy that's going on there. So that's why water, there's an osmotic movement of water into the gut. So movement, water is moving inside your small intestine and thus diarrhea is caused, which is basically the loss of watery feces. And then as a result of this, the, suff the person can suffer from dehydration and loss of ions from the blood, which is why they are regularly advised to take saline, um, saline uh, solutions, a mixture of water, salt and sugar, which is yeah basically the only treatment you have for this. And you regularly have to rehydrate because of the dehydration cost, because, of, because you're losing so much water via feces. And yeah, that's basically it. So important point. The toxin causes secretion of chloride ions into the small intestine, which causes water to move into the small intestine, which leads to diarrhea. That's, it's really a three-step process. And yeah. Now, if, if it's left untreated, cholera can lead to death. That's why it's so important to rehydrate immediately and make sure that the water is clean and safe for drinking because otherwise it kind of defeats the whole process, um, whole point of it. And you're just drinking contaminated water again and yeah that, that's why it's so important to have clean and safe drinking water okay so now we'll look at some points for staying safe and it's basically that just that you have to dispose of garbage properly and make sure that you're not throwing away sensitive stuff with normal garbage because that could lead to the transmission of diseases again. And you just have to make sure you, you maintain proper hygiene, regularly wash your hands and clean surfaces. And that's basically it. Okay. And also get vaccinated because that's the best way you can acquire active immunity, which provides long-term immunity. And that's the chapter. Now we'll look at some questions. This is October, November, 2017. Barrier to pathogens. A. Acid in the stomach. No, that's chemical. B. Hair in the nose. Yes, but let's look at the other stuff. Mucus in the trachea. No, that's chemical. Phagocytosis in the blood. No, that's a cell process. So the correct answer is B. Hair in the nose. Okay, this is February, March 2021. Which diagram shows how a, vaccin how a vaccination can lead to long-term immunity? Okay, so we're looking at a process here. So let's look at A, antigen in injected. Next step is lymphocytes multiply, and then antibodies are produced and memory cells are produced. That looks about right to me. Let's look at the other ones. Memory cell injected, no, you cannot inject memory cells. So that just de de uh, disqualifies the answer right there, the first step. Let's look at C, antigen uh, injected, okay. Memory cells multiply, Antibody production comes before memory cell production. That's something you should remember. Okay, and then lymphocytes produced, antibodies are produced. Lymphocytes are present in your blood, so they're not really being produced when it's exposed to antigen. So C is not the correct answer. Let's look at D, antibody injected. Okay, the question said long-term immunity, and option D is antibody injected, which leads to short-term immunity. So that can't be it. So the correct answer is A, and yeah, that, that, that's about it. That's chapter 10, diseases and immunity. Thank you so much for this informative session, Afreen, and we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye-bye.